with Miletios Buliopoulos. Miletios is a Greek music historian and an archivist. He is founder of the nonprofit organization, Greek Cultural Resources. Mileti is an author, a researcher, and a lecturer, and he produces a weekly radio program and is a consultant to the Hellenic Chronicle Digitization Project. So Mileti, we need for you to tell everybody about your radio program because I have listened to it and it's phenomenal. Oh, and thanks. Nancy, welcome. We're so happy to meet you. Thank Nancy Agris Savage is the team leader of the Hellenic Chronicle Digitization Project. And she's the executive director of the Peter Agris Memorial Journalism Scholarships. She's the former editor in chief of the Hellenic Chronicle and a senior staff counsel of the House, the US um, House Foreign Relations Committee, Foreign Affairs Committee, excuse me. We are so thrilled to have you both with us. Please tell us about your project. We can't wait to hear about it. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Thank you to our hosts for inviting us and to the participants for giving us your time. I'd like to provide a little bit of background on what has brought us to this place. As the program says, I'm the team leader of the Hellenic Chronicle Digitization Project, the former editor in chief of the newspaper and the daughter of its founder, the late Peter Agris. A journalist myself, I literally grew up in the newsroom. In September 1950, at the age of 24, my father founded the first weekly journalistic vehicle, American in form, but Greek in substance. Its tagline read, the American voice of Hellenic expression. His eminence, Archbishop Yakovos of blessed memory, tried to dissuade my father from going down this road where others had failed. Peter Agris, however, had two things going for him, an incredible sense of mission and a gift for bringing people together. His goal was, not to, was to unite Greeks assimilating in the United States, not to report news from Greece in a way that benefited one homeland party versus another. Targeting first generation Greek Americans, its pages charted the expansion of our archdiocese, the proud history of our cultural organizations and the professional celebrations and of individuals and families, information that had not been available elsewhere. The newspaper soon gathered a national following making it the largest Greek American weekly newspaper in the United States. Its editorial policy was to promulgate the strength of the Greek community. There were no exposés. As Adweek stated, the Hellenic Chronicle has prospered mightily because it has performed its duties with feeling for the community it serves. Peter Agris and his staff brought the news for almost 40 years until sadly, he would leave his family and life's work too soon, dying in 1989 at only 62. At that time, after moving to Washington to pursue my own passion of working in politics on Capitol Hill, I made the decision to return to Boston and take over the helm of the newspaper for its final chapter. More than a decade, Later, with a new century dawning and with changing times in the journalistic world and in personal lives, I made the decision to let a new generation take up the challenge. On September 20, 2000, the 50th anniversary to the day of the newspaper's incredibly successful run, the Helena Chronicle published its final edition. What remained was a rich compilation of over 55,000 pages of a half century of Greek American community history, seeking to ensure it would be accessible to researchers and individuals alike. Alike, I donated the hardcover archive to the Archbishop Yakovos Library on the campus of Hellenic College Holy Cross School of Theology in Boston to be housed in its special collections room. Despite being meticulously cared for by the staff, 
time began to wither its pages to a state comparable to crumbling phyllo dough. It has been a dream of mine for two decades to fully digitize the archive, to make it readily searchable and accessible online and to preserve it for current and future generations. Initially reaching out to mainstream data preservation companies, I received estimates in the range of $150,000. Well, I believe in dreaming big and have tackled some pretty challenging projects in my day, that nut was too big for me to crack. Thankfully, we found a way. Inspired by my father's example and blessed by resources for which I am profoundly grateful. First and foremost, teaming up with my good friend and respected archivist, Mileti Pouliopoulos, whose expertise would get the manual digitization done and whose contacts throughout the academic and cultural community are unparalleled through his work with Greek cultural resources. Second, our partnership with the Alpha Omega Council of New England, a philanthropic organization of Americans of Greek descent out of Boston, founded in 1976 by my late father which also shared the Chronicle's mission of uniting Greek Americans. This then paved the way for additional partnerships and generous support from the AHEPA, the Hellenic Women's Club, the Lingos Family Foundation, Loganiko Society, and many other organizations and individual donors. Third, the support of the Archbishop Yakovos Library and the Harvard Library, as well as coverage by the Pappas Post, Grecian Echoes Radio, and other vital media voices. Fourth, an independent campaign to raise $50,000 undertaken by a committee of individuals from within our community. The support across all levels was energizing. In an interview, ABC News commentator George Stephanopoulos said, I grew up with the Hellenic Chronicle. It was essential reading in our home and one of the strongest threads binding America's Greek community into a family. The archives are a vital resource to anyone studying the story of Greeks in America. Nicholas Gage, who I know you all heard from yesterday, author and investigative journalist, who by the way, helped pay for his BU education working three afternoons a week at the Hellenic Chronicle, said the Hellenic Chronicle was the Boswell of the Greek community during the second half of the 20th century and will remain an invaluable source for anyone interested in the Greek diaspora. It's an enduring part of the great mosaic that is immigrant life in America. We are extremely proud to announce the completion of phase one, an independently searchable database allowing for high-speed search, retrieval, and manipulation of articles and photographs in JPEG and PDF formats. The team was overwhelmed by the support evidence during two soft launches at which we were honored to have special guests Greek Ambassador Alexandra Papadopoulou, Governor Michael Dukakis, Nick Gage, AOL founder Ted Leonsis, and scores of other leaders and academics. Of many of the most incredible moments that stood out for me during those launches were comments from another speaker this weekend, Professor Alexandra Kitroff. Speaking of the wealth of information from within the archive that he counted on for his book on Ahepa's 100th anniversary, he highlighted one of the roles the newspaper played of which I am most proud. The only Greek publication which editorially supported Archbishop Yakovos's successful drive in the 1970s to introduce English into the divine liturgy services celebrated in Greek Orthodox parishes in America. This became known as the, the language war. 
In my career in journalism and during my 15 years in government on the staff of the House Foreign Affairs Committee, the critical importance of free and open access to historical records has been ingrained in me. It is with this at the forefront of my mind that I began this project. We owe it to those who chartered our path and to the generations to come who seek to understand it to preserve our history in perpetuity. The work is now underway for phase two to raise funds for a permanent home for the archive. I hope I have piqued your interest in helping us complete this work, which will provide Greek genealogists, researchers, and individuals alike free access to a portrait of our community's history in America. Now, it is my honor to turn the program over to the man who has done the real work here, my partner, Meletis Pouliopoulos. Thank you, Nancy. <clears throat> and thank you to the uh, Greek Ancestry team for having us here to talk about the Hellenic Chronicle newspaper digitization project. You know, the thing about ancestry and, and searching your roots, it's, it's exciting. It's exciting to know that your father was you know, lived in Manchester, New Hampshire, but even more exciting to understand what he did and the context of the, um, the society and the culture, what it was like when he was growing up. That's something that the newspaper provides. So I feel that I wanna share with you as well, some things, not just about the project, but about the newspaper. Here's the cover of the first issue from September of 1950. Um, as Nancy had mentioned, the newspaper published for 50 years. It was a weekly newspaper written in English and geared to uh, the Greek American community. It's a clearly a historic and important historic record of that community. And what we had found was that the traditional libraries had gotten rid of uh, their paper editions. Uh, this has happened with so many other publications. We're not the only ones, but um, it certainly did uh, hit home, if you will, because the Chronicle was so special. The most complete archive that we had was that which Nancy had and her family had donated to the Archbishop Yakovos Library. Um, there were some other smaller collections. I even have a few hundred copies here in my home. Um, but by and large, it was the Yakovos Library that we had to work with. We also had beyond the paper copies, a uh, partial microfilm uh, that we could see at that point. And it was clear that we had to save everything. So Nancy organized the project team. And uh, this was the team in the beginning. Uh, we asked Hilary Rogler, the head librarian at the Yakovos Library to to actually do a count and uh, come up with a list of what we had. And then Rhea Lesage to reach out to uh, nationally and to other libraries and say, do you have any copies? Here are some issues that we know that are missing. Can you help us to fill the gaps? And so um, when we sat down to look at the archive, we noticed that the papers were in this condition even the ones that were in binders like this one. Now, this binder, if you can see, it has almost like nails going across. There's spikes, it's like a three ring binder, but this is pretty severe. They actually punched right through the newspapers. Uh, so uh, in the early binders, uh, this is what we found, uh, that a lot of the issues were damaged in this way. Information, which by the way, is lost for all time. Other paper copies were just put in boxes, not archival boxes, just any old box. And it really looked like filo though, after one week. One little shake, and this is a, a page from the, the movie, The Mummy. When we went into those loose papers, lo and behold, we found pages that had cutouts. And so it wasn't just an exercise of counting the issues, but finding which pages were damaged in that way. Well, the binders, the later uh, bound editions, they were glued and stitched, but even those had cutouts. <laughs> you can see 
uh, this is just a few pages that we turned inside of one of these binders. So it became clear that our work was going to be to try to replace these pages, not to say that we have this issue, because we don't. We have part of this issue. And, and that's what was happening. In the end, we found that over 30% of our uh, collection for the first 10 years was missing, perhaps missing for all time. That the bound volumes, the later volumes, were in much better condition, but they were starting to show their age. And eventually, we knew that they would become lost. And we had partial microfilm. So we had a situation where we had some of the newspapers and some of the microfilm and what we were, what could we do? So Nancy mentioned some of the people that stepped up with funding, initial funding, and we did go out and survey and it was just way too expensive for us to do it externally uh, for quality control and, and being able to make sure we have a complete archive and we did it right, we did it in house. But then we reached a point where our funding dried up and we found ourselves, though well, we had some nice uh, articles in the newspaper, Nancy and I found ourselves out, you know, pounding the pavement again for, for funding. And we really weren't sure how this whole project was going to unfold going forward. You know, I, I had, uh, we had those heart to hearts and said, you know, the, the community just has to step up here. Someone's got to see the importance. And uh, so we decided to do a soft launch. And by that, it was going out with what we had up to that point, making it accessible um, for the years which we had, which was a considerable amount of work. We had done at that point uh, about 10 years of uh, paper uh, scanning and OCR work and a bunch of uh, years within the microfilm and made it a searchable archive. We, we invited the, the, the people who had donated to the project up until that point. And that was important because, you know, we still had to fund the project to move it forward. We wanted to also invite, and we did the key stakeholders, the, the people that this should mean a lot to, and certainly academia, um, it, it means a lot to the professors or the people out there that have been studying Greek American history there's a handful of them. It's always been a struggling kind of course um, that still has yet to emerge. They understood how important it was. We also invited the church scholars. You know, the Chronicle was a place where a lot of scholarly articles were written. Surprisingly, you, would, you, you wouldn't think that. You'd say, ah, oh, you know, you'd shove it off. But there were a lot of excellent, excellent articles that were written, both uh, from church scholars and from scholars that were, uh, you know, just in general public. We also have all the history of all the organizations, both church, both secular and non-secular. And so we want to invite the community leaders. We wanted them to step up and see maybe they would take on a project and update their histories. Certainly, if they just knew, if they could just remember for the ones that were around, they would see how much wonderful history was in, in, in these pages of the Hellenic Chronicle. We also invited the members of the media past and present, I'd say the Greek media. Several months had passed since we had our first round of, of news articles and we needed a little bump. We needed someone else to pick up the story and spread the word, but we also wanted to reach out to those people that had worked for so many years in the media and understood the real value of what the Helena Chronicle did in its time. Ultimately, we wanted to build engagement. And if you have this sort of a project, you really do want to get people on board and support it. And that was really, I think, the primary goal of our soft launch. But the harsh reality was, you know, it brought us back to a funding question, um, which is, you know, how are we going to finish where we had done maybe about, about a third of the work at, up to that point, how are we gonna get the funds to finish the digitization piece just to get us through what we were calling at the time phase one? So uh, fortunately, um, as Nancy mentioned, many people turned out to sing the praises of the Chronicle. They turned out to support the paper and we were able to finish phase one. 
The two bylines that did stand out were the newspaper went by the American Voice of Hellenic Expression, and also that it was dedicated to American Hellenic and Orthodox ideals. It really says a lot about the paper and, and what it was uh, standing for and what audience it was serving. In the 35th anniversary issue, Peter Agris, the founder and publisher of the paper, said that the Hellenic Chronicle came out of three needs. One, there was a need for a voice uh, to speak out on issues of importance to the Hellenic community in America. There also needed to be a link behind, between all the communities that were separate. And, you know, this was pre-internet, if you can imagine, okay? A lot of the radio stations were just local. We needed something that was going to link all of the communities across the country and also in the international world, letting them know what was happening. Peter recognized there was a need for the preservation of the common heritage and culture that we all share. I just thought that was brilliant encapsulation that uh, he published in the 35th anniversary issue. This is the publishing block from 1962. And you see right under the, uh, the title of the Hellenic Chronicle, it says, the newspaper for Americans of Greek ancestry. Wow, it, that says it. That just says it right there. And uh, you'll see uh, Nicholas Gage at this point in 1962 was a copy editor on the paper. How can, I, how can we begin to describe what it was like getting this newspaper in those years? And how much history is in those pages? Just a, a friend of mine, I was doing an interview and he told me he was, he's an older man, he's in his eighties. And he said, you know, there was a point where the US government military didn't recognize orthodoxy. So if you were in the military, you know, you're on the ship and the captain says, okay, line up all the Catholics over there, the Protestants over there, the, the Greeks, the Orthodox were all just standing around. And um, so I, I had no idea about this. I mean, I heard a little bit about it. There was something about dog tags when I was growing up. I remember hearing about that, but this was actually, there were people that, that, that did the right, made the right moves to get orthodoxy recognized. Now, people today, younger people today will find this article and say, dog tags? What's this about? Greek Orthodox dogs? <laughs> you know, they may not even understand just by the headline. How do you get people to look into in-depth articles, in-depth stories <clears throat> beyond the five-minute little news bite? The paper had all of the history of the Greek church in America and of the school because it, it existed. The paper started before the uh, Holy Cross Hellenic College was formed. It was already it, before it had moved to Brookline. So these are artist depictions. These are sketches of what the school campus would look like, what the Archbishop Yakovos uh, library looks like, which is a little bit different today, but these were artist sketches. They had this for every church and every community in this country but they were in the Hellenic Chronicle. Every consecration, every blessing, it was all there. And you know, the thing, the reason that I mentioned in Greek Orthodoxy is because this was an ex a, a, a sectional time. These were first and second generation people who were attending the seminary from all over the country. And they were going back into the communities. And so there was this ebb and flow and there was this national feel of a community that, has just eroded over time. Generations now of priests within America, and we were reading about them. We were reading about the Orthodox faith and understanding it in a way beyond, you know, for, of course, we went to church, we went to Sunday school and this and that, but the Hellenic Chronicle reinforced aspects of uh, Greek Orthodoxy. Nicholas Gage mentioned the University Club, and I, I couldn't resist. This is uh, from his alma mater from 1959 uh, from Boston University, the Orthodox Club. There was a whole youth movement that took place in America. And if you could hear half of what they did, it was amazing. They did huge nationwide fund drives for books and for funding for the school for the library, uh, you know, see the Goya in action. Yeah, absolutely. I lived it, this was my generation. I came at the end of this wave. 
how exciting it was for me to find Andrew Copin, who was one of the founders of the Goya, the Greek Orthodox Jews of America, that he was a regular contributor to the Chronicle. And uh, these are uh, history. I mean, he was a, a scholar of the history of the Greeks in Chicago. He was also a professor. Uh, and a lot of his papers are there, but his stories are in the Chronicle. Think about the fundraising that we were able to do in those years and the role that the Chronicle played. And we're talking about fundraising internally for things like the school or externally for international crises or things that were happening in Greece. Seems like there was one earthquake after another. The story of how the Greeks rose to those causes is part of the Greek American history that is not being taught. We have lost that history. The teachers are, were a couple of generations removed from this. And that's why the Chronicle is going to help to fill that gap of information, to, to help illustrate this period. If you go through the historic pages, you're going to see that all of the organizations just about had regular updates, nationwide updates from both church organizations and cultural and civic organizations from all over. I mean, this is from Falls Church, Virginia. Now, I mean, think about it, and back in those years, also we got to see what these organizations were doing. It just wasn't a barrage of pictures, but gee, I had read something about Professor Mary Lefkowitz, and it was interesting to see what the daughters were doing. Or what are these foundations doing? Who were the uh, leaders of the community that were being honored? What were their contributions? And we read about these stories and we understood that, wow, you know, the Greeks here in America really are doing a lot. We really are contributing to society. We've lost that history. The Chronicle also had all of the conventions, Boston, because, well, we had, you know, it's a big city. We had a lot of the convention here, the Cretans, but there were national conventions, regional conventions from all different sides. I mean, from all over the country. And generally there would be a photo like this of a few of the principal people and there'd be a couple of articles of what came out and what good they're doing. Also the academics, I mean, they love the Chronicle. They love the Chronicle because they could get their articles published. And so we saw Hellenic thought advancing. Indeed, there are countless articles on Greek ancestry, how to find your Greek ancestors. And this is going back now years ago. We could still learn from a lot of these articles. Um, I, I followed up on some of this stuff. Some of you know of Mary Voltsos. She worked for the government. She had published this before Ancestry.com. She, she was, she had published the book. Well, she also wrote a number of articles. And lo and behold, some of these are republished from etymology of Greek names. I just love this. Everyone always asks. Where does Akis come from, you know, and that kind of stuff. She had I, just one search to show you how dynamic our archive is. I did one quick search on Mary Voltsos and I found uh, 11 articles that she had written. Other articles about scholars, and this was about someone who wrote a wonderful story. Uh, it was in multiple parts, I think maybe six parts about the Greeks in Rhode Island, you know. We don't, uh, most of you know of Theodor Saloutsos. He was a huge scholar of Greek American history. Some of his articles appeared. These are writings. This is not just journalism, but it's history. It's Greek American history that we're saving here. This is so important. Now, this is really cool. A lot of people are interested in the, in the stories of the early immigrants. This is a republished article from 1906. And it was in, by the way, it was in several parts. It was in three parts, long, long story about this Greek that came who was a pushcart peddler. Story that, you know, has been lost. That newspaper has never been digitized. It was a small local newspaper out of New York. Here's the story that Nancy mentioned about the whole, the whole debate in the church and across Greek America, about whether or not we should have Greek in the church. What level of Greek or English should we have? And look what the Chronicle did. In this page, the archbishop's on the right track. And then further down, it says basically it doesn't have a clue. 
So <laughs> there was always both sides of issues that were being presented in the Chronicle. Great story, and I don't have to tell you folks, uh, finding an obituary can be the, the greatest blessing to understanding your, your, root, your roots, your family and that history. One of the former directors of the Manchester Historic Association uh, had asked me about a family in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, down the road from me, the Zacharulas family. Now they were an old family, and I had interviewed people 30 years ago that told me of the Zacharulases. And he told me why he needed this information and that um, he had just done a DNA test and found that he had a daughter, 63 years old, who was adopted by the Zacharulases. It was that article that wasn't published anywhere else that gave him all of the history they needed. Now, in terms of phase two, here's where we're at. We're looking to find or build a, a permanent home for the online archive. And that's, uh, there's a lot of irons in the fire. This is, we wanna make it free for everybody where it's not a pay to play kind of thing. And we have a certain amount of archive maintenance because we're being careful. We're going through and we're saying, okay, well, this wasn't in the microfilm. Now we have to scan the paper or vice versa. We've scanned this and now there's a big hole in it. So <clears throat> that completes uh, the story of what we've prepared today. Uh, thank you so much for inviting us. This is such an exciting project. It's the first of many newspapers and books that we really need to work on. So thank you for having us. Thank you so much, Meletti and Nancy. This has been enlightening for us. And uh, we so appreciate you coming um, on with us today and giving us a walk through time of Hellenic American history and the importance that this newspaper has played in our lives. Thank you so much. We wish you the best and we look forward to staying in touch with you and seeing how the project is going. Thank you. Absolutely, thank you.